Well, I very much appreciate everybody being here. Uh, my, my aim in these lectures is to present a new way of thinking about language, and more specifically, about the relations between meaning and use, or between what's said and the activity of saying it. To, to do that, I want to introduce a new meta-theoretic conceptual apparatus and develop it through application to a number of sort of locutions that have properly long been the, the focus of intense philosophical interest. Logical and semantic vocabulary, indexical vocabulary, modal, normative, and intentional vocabularies. The concerns that animate this enterprise arise from a way of thinking about the general project that's been pursued by analytic philosophy over the past century or so, and in particular about its epic confrontation with Wittgenstein and Wittgenstein, justifying our surrendering of all additions to take a look at the TV system, it will be well to begin those trees to surrender to the same as the law of logic, right? We need to house these. We need to use our automatic reasons to have an assimilation between the vocabulary and the vocabulary called the tag latch head of the vocabulary. I suggest that this relation is a form of question as well as a one of the ways that we can make sense of the relations of the one kind of essential research of the relation to the past and other This is what I call the general research. So, for instance, the thing to do is to make sense of the past and other projects. We've seen several of the genius of the past and other projects. We've seen several of the genius of the past and other projects. We've seen several of the genius of the past and other projects. We've seen several of the genius of the past and other projects. We've seen several of the genius of the past and other projects. We've seen several of the genius of the past and other the nature of vision is in its own outcome, which is in turn has these significant and various subjects. Not only have the recursive subject of the translation, but also the traditional characteristics of the subject. It's not a practical test, but it's a fascination of the subject. 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 The world Again, just in the Sometimes <laughs> 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 
Seems to me that people who read Darwin in the realize that the kinds of accounts of the basics of the world from Plato and the Torah and such pieces the biggest So, the problem for philosophers is what is it and the obvious answer is that they have not used to the words. They have not used to the language they can do or the language. So the problem of being properly in search of truth in terms of linguistics, it is here instead of in terms of the platonic metaphor of grasp of the After Darwin, it becomes very hard to say that when in the language of grasp of the truth, it's much easier to say that they've developed language to a matter of language. So, as so after Darwin, the don't ask the question which language Just as which language human beings will need lots of which language is the people stop asking And this meant dropping the things to we don't need to ask which language is associated with the the task. What is given to the task? The literary language of the age is the literary language. One way of thinking of it is that the poem Thank you. 
definitions or meanings how expressed in other languages. It is for a time change cycle that the processes of development are not the same as the experiments And that's why the collection of such processes is not the same as the result of such as the development of the dynamic processes are But I don't think we're obliged to use the doctrine of approach in the semantic context. They can be seen as complements to the Any 
Ontology is the theory of To understand what ontology is, therefore, we must understand the phrase what there is, which points to the question what is there. Obviously, if someone were asked this question out of the blue, we would not be able to make it, as they were philosophers. For philosophers carry around with them a context or ambience in which otherwise startling questions are relevant at home. In this case, however, even if we are in a philosophical mood, we cannot help but be puzzled by this question if we linger on it for a moment and don't rush on to specific issues of ontology. At this point, I might discuss the grammar of what questions in general is to call attention to the fact that in an ordinary context, we would feel the question to be incomplete, expecting some such continuation of it. What is there which has 12 pairs of legs to each other? And instead, I will make the obvious point that when the uh, ontologist who asks this question does, uh, he is concerned with kind. As is so often the case, a grammatical, a grammatical singular at the surface carries uh, uh, conceals plurality in the depth. On the other hand, a paraphrase of the, uh, of the question, of the initial question as what kinds of women are there, would and should be met with resistance. Thus, an ontologist might well object that his concern is not with what kinds of women are, but this admits his answers, means of kinds, plus lions of kinds, dragon of kinds. And although there might be, these might be of interest to him as a zoologist and ontologist, and in the case of the evening of the and philosophers, when as an ontologist he asks what is there, he is not looking for empty kinds. It is not to say that the kind of the kind, which is by no means empty, might not be a great. From his point of view, then, a more adequate paraphrase would be, what kinds are there such that there are things of that kind? Yet although this account has the virtue of leading these instances in such cases as there are lines, there are teen sizes, there are many writers, it obviously begins at a high level of abstraction, a very high abstraction. It strikes us that our original question might as well have been, what are there? To which there are lines, and there are records, and there are records, to the classical distinction between ordinary terms and categories. And instead of addressing myself directly, I'm just going to have to take a long time to do the same as far as the judges. Yet today, I do want to find studies in the world. What stage of this world? The unlogical dialogue of the judges is fun gentle with the unlogical dialogue of the judges. Turn. 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 Thank <laughs> you. 
Thomas is 
Now, which are the Thank you. 
practice is concerned to fill in the three sets of the autonomous deployment of any vocabulary at all. VV sufficiency in relation. I'm going to argue that the most important way to explain the intrinsicness of a logic to a privileged role in the to logical vocabulary. Those are by the classical project of philosophical analysis. What I've called semantic logic consequence relation is by appeal to this whole constellation of basic meaning use relations. Defining incompatibility. The complex mediated in terms of pragmatically mediated semantic relation that results from it. And semantically introducing logical vocabulary. My last three lectures are going to address modal vocabulary in terms of incompatibility, normative vocabulary, and the pragmatically mediated semantic relations they stand in to ordinary objective empirical and naturalistic vocabularies and to each other. The modal revolution in the last third of the 20th century breathed new life into semantic logicism. That apart from this powerful new expressive tools, analysis, which have been of great use never to those pursuing, for instance, naturalistic out. programs in semantics, the relation between logical vocabulary and other vocabularies. But this successor version raises just the same questions of vindication logical that I'll be considering for semantic logicism in my second lecture. Characteristic what justifies according modal concepts this special privilege role in our new, semantic analytic enterprise? Uh, this question is particularly urgent since the empiricist program well, had always been. Traditionally, the in the 20th century, century logical form of mind, particularly and specifically hostile to this, and critical I'll shift this focus by turning attention in my next lecture. I'll begin my treatment of modality in the fourth lecture with a consideration with a of this question and with a vindication of the role of modal vocabulary from yet a different parallel the one I will already have issue of ordinary logical understand. That is, modal relations to can be elaborated from and is explicative or if you prefer, of features integral to every autonomous discursive practice. As it bears on features intimately related to and distinct from the relations between subjects and objects, which will itself show up in this context in terms of an extended pragmatic relation between the new thing and deontic, that is, between modal and normative vocabularies. When we look at those vocabularies through the lens of meaning use analysis, a sequence of startling relations emerges. For a start, I'll argue that deontic normative vocabulary is also universally LX. That is, that it's VP sufficient to specify practices or abilities that are both PV necessary for deploying any autonomous vocabulary and PP sufficient for practices or abilities PV sufficient for deploying the deontic normative vocabulary that explicates them. Although in this regard it belongs in a box with alethic modal vocabulary, the features of autonomous vocabulary use that normative vocabulary explicates are quite different from those explicated by modal vocabulary. I'll then argue that what lies behind Seller's dark and pregnant claim that the language of modality is a transposed language of norms is the fact that deontic normative vocabulary can serve as a pragmatic metavocabulary for alethic modal vocabulary. And in my fifth lecture, I'll show how exploiting that relation makes possible a new kind of directly modal formal semantics, one that makes no appeal at any point to a notion of truth, incompatibility semantics. It, in turn, gives us a new semantic perspective both on traditional logical vocabulary and on modal vocabulary. The final lecture will then weave all these strands into a meaning use analysis of intentionality itself what's expressed by intentional vocabulary. As, pr as a pragmatically mediated semantic relation, essentially involving both what's expressed by modal and what's expressed by normative vocabulary. The title of this lecture series is Between Saying and Doing, and it evidently refers to my aspiration to present new ways of thinking about the relations between meaning and use that arise when we think systematically about saying what we're doing when we're saying something. But the phrase itself is taken from an Italian proverb. Between saying and doing, many a pair of shoes is worn out. Following the argumentative and constructive path that I'm proposing for exploring the intricate and revealing ways in which semantics and pragmatics interdigitate will require wearing out quite a few shoes. Thank you.